frame rater. Once we have an emulator installed, we have to launch it. Where you've put it depends on you, but for me I put it in a subfolder on the C drive. Let's get into those home consoles, starting with the Atari 2600. The emulator I'll be using is called Z26XV7. The first thing I do every time I start an emulator on the Xbox is to make sure I'm getting a proper aspect ratio. This ensures the games will look the way they were meant to look, and can also prevent visual distortion. Z26XV7 has the same interface as pretty much a majority of the emulators on the Xbox. All you have to do is set the screen size position to size to fit, keep aspect ratio, and you're good to start playing some games. I'll only be mentioning it this once, but do consider this option for every forthcoming emulator. Whether it's this easy or not, it should be there, but if the option is missing from the emulator, I'll be sure to let you know about it. Playing typical 2600 games was no problem. I even tried some of the most infamous examples without any flaw. Tried paddle games, which was interesting. For these, the control is set to both left and right triggers as analog. By default, it's inverted, which was disorienting. Over time and practice, you might be able to adjust to this control method, but it doesn't beat a traditional paddle. For any other games, you should have no problems. An excellent emulator. Magnavox's second Odyssey console is next, using Odyssey XV3 Beta 3. Games in this emulator played at full speeds, however, as I usually come across with the Odyssey 2, some games wouldn't react to my controls. I've never used a real Odyssey 2 before, so I'm sure there was some fault on my end, but oddly enough, the results are often inconsistent. I remember getting Super Cobra to work on another emulator long ago, no problem, but here I can't. In this Tutankham game, I get to hear this man's cries of pain get consistently louder, and there's nothing I can do about it. Hilarious! Point of the matter is, the games with which I was able to control worked perfectly. Next is the Intellivision using Bliss XV10. Emulating Intellivision on the Xbox, performance-wise, is great. The only problem is irrelevant to the emulator, it's just that the way the original Intellivision controlled was so... bad. Games like Shark Shark are frustrating for that reason alone. Perhaps an irrelevant comment, but hey, here's something relevant. Controller overlays for the Intellivision games are included. Pull these up by clicking the left analog stick down, and make your selection. Great stuff! For the ColecoVision, we'll be using an emulator called Atom XV6. While this system does use a keypad controller, all you should really need is mapped already. Starting a single player game is usually done with a number 1, which is mapped. Thanks to this, starting up a game is super easy. The games run at full speed and feel great on the Xbox. The Atari 5200 emulator is multi-purpose, so we'll be revisiting it again later into the computer segment. This emulator is called Atari XL Box V8.05B. So for whatever dumb reason, this emulator has the start button unbound by default, a button you need to start a majority of the 5200 library. What an oversight. Once you've sorted that out, it works great. Eh, well, the ones that boot do. A small few games like Mega Mania might crash your Xbox, for some reason. A shame since that's one of my favorites for the system. For whatever game you can get to boot, you should be able to enjoy a solid experience. For emulating the Vectrex, we'll use Mestrex V3. Wow, the overlays for each existing Vectrex game are here! That's some dedicated stuff! The games play just fine, though I feel there's something funky going on with the resolution here. The lines look sloppier than I remember. Even compared to old footage I recorded, everything looks a bit squished for some reason. Whatever the case, the games themselves all ran at full speed. The synthesized voices for Spike were missing, but that's the only gameplay-related mishap I came across. If you want to play Vectrex today, this isn't a bad choice. Another multipurpose emulator surfaces as we look into Sega's SG-1000 console. This emulator is Mecha XV2, which also covers Sega's Game Gear and Master System. Rumor has it there exists a third release of this emulator, but I wasn't able to find a copy of it. Maybe that would fix the single issue that I had with it, but that's relevant to a Master System game, so I won't bring that up just yet. Regarding the emulation of SG-1000, Mecha XV2 does everything right. Full speeds, fully playable, fully enjoyable. Nintendo is next with Mendafen XNES V15. Mendafen, huh? That's a familiar name. For several reasons. This emulator achieves all it needs to, being a smooth and accurate experience that plays anything I throw at it, even the bootlegs. What can I say other than, it's excellent. The Atari 7800 emulator is known as Atari 7800 XV6. Much like the last emulator, there's nothing but good things to say about this. Everything worked well at that. It's all I'd want from a 7800 emulator. We'll now return to Mecha XV2 for emulation of the Sega Master System. So as I said earlier, there was one issue I had with Master System emulation on this, and what would that be? Well, the music in Sonic 2 played a bit too fast. I tested a good few games and nothing stood out to me other than that. Most of the Sonic games were chuggy, but then I found out that's actually just how these games were played on the Master System themselves. If you want to try your luck with other Master System emulators, there does exist one multi-platform emulator I'll mention in like less than a minute for the Sega Genesis. 
That one will also play older Sega console games, but it wouldn't even boot Sonic Chaos, so make of that as you will. For TurboGrafx-16 or PC Engine games, Mendefen XPC EV6 is the place to be. No flaws to make note of, a completely flawless experience from what I played. It'll also play Super Graphics games if that's your thing. Yeah, all seven of them. Now for that multipurpose emulator which emulates pretty much every Sega console ever, at least from the Sega 32X and under. For Sega Genesis emulation, Neo Gen's Plus GX V1B10 is the choice of champions. It uses a few different cores for ultimate compatibility. It'll even run Virtua Racing, with pretty crackly audio, but it's a step above Neo Genesis, another Xbox Genesis emulator I tried that couldn't run Virtua Racing at all. Even still, no real reason when you've got access to the 32X release that plays much better here. I'll save those comments for a minute though. This emulator is kind of like an overclocked Genesis, with a few exceptions. Why I say that is because some games that have performance issues on the original hardware, like Duke Nukem 3D, played far better here. In fact, for Duke Nukem 3D, the soundtrack got a bit mushed at times because of how much better the game is playing than usual. Not faster than it was designed to be played, but better than a stock Genesis. This difference you shouldn't notice in many Genesis games. Those that already played fine on stock hardware will probably play just fine here, if not better. I didn't notice a single instance of dropped frames on anything other than virtual racing. While this emulator does serve as a bit of a Sega hub, with its ability to play many Sega consoles before it, I wouldn't say it does those particularly well. Like I said, it wouldn't even boot Sonic Chaos. Nonetheless, this was the best emulator I found for the Genesis on Xbox, and yep, it's pretty sweet. The Super Nintendo has some competition on the Xbox, but these days there's no question about it. ZSNE Xbox V3.7, which may be a bit of a sensory overload in its UI, <laughs> is the most accurate emulator for SNES on the Xbox. Let me tell you, I tried a good few of these. I thought the effort was futile to get a great working Super Nintendo emulator on the Xbox, until last on my list was this one, and it was a true case of saving the best for last. The majority of games, intensive and Super FX ones, will run just fine here. The only problem I had, if you can even call it that, was slightly crackly audio in Star Fox, but it was honestly barely noticeable in the first place. The emulator also seems to have some sort of anti-aliasing turned on by default, which looks great. This is an incredible emulator. For emulation of the Sega CD, we turn back again to Neo Gen's Plus GX V1B10. 32X emulation will take place on the same emulator. Fun fact, that old Sonic CD video I did? I had the full intention of recording my playthrough via this Xbox emulator, or at least one very similar that ran discs, since I still had my complete copy of Sonic CD at that point. Oh, speaking of which, this one also runs discs. But then I came to this screen, and had to resort to the Sonic Gems collection release instead. I didn't have to do that, I just couldn't figure out how to access this options screen to initialize the RAM cartridge. It's literally so easy, just boot the system and before the game starts, go into the BIOS menu and format the memory. Then you can start the game and it'll work just fine, as did every other game I tested. How about 32X games though? Tried a handful of games, Afterburner Complete didn't boot, but I guess you just have the original Genesis releases for that. Otherwise all games I tried played flawlessly, except for Star Wars the Arcade game. It was just slightly playable if I'm being honest. Every second or so, the frame rate would go to zero, then back to normal, and then back down to zero. Short increments of time, but so frequently that, yeah, I could never consider playing the whole game like this. It's pretty funny how as we get into the 32-bit and above platforms, the order of playability is all over the place. I guess that's understandable though for some of them, like being a console that we all know but barely any of us have touched. The 3DO, emulated with 3DO X VA 0.715. Here's the first emulator on the list that forces you into a 480p resolution, so as I elaborated on earlier, I had to put my camera up to the TV to record audio. Sorry if you can hear other background noise, I tried my best. So on first impression, I had no idea what to do. I couldn't get any of the ROMs to actually boot. It just went to this blank insert CD screen. Luckily, like with the Sega CD emulator, it takes discs. Wasn't expecting that for such a slow emulator. Oh yeah, so the emulator is slow? What can you expect from a platform of this era nobody really cared about? That being said, this still really impressed me. It ran far better than I expected. I thought I'd get between 2 and 3 frames per second, but no, you get just under 10 for some games and even sound emulation. It's not playable, unfortunately, but the potential is here. If anyone was dedicated enough, this could turn into something incredible. For now, it's still an astonishing feat that you probably wouldn't try more than once for curiosity's sake. By the way, you can't change the aspect ratio, the screen is stretched, and I'm fairly sure you can't do anything about that. Here's another console most haven't played, the Atari Jaguar, emulated on Virtual Jaguar XV 1.20. Well call me impressed again, these games are playing at a pretty good frame rate. Alien vs Predator is playing similar to the speeds you'd see on actual hardware. The only problem is that there are many graphical glitches and unfortunately no sound. At least that was the default configuration, turning it on was said to cause the speed to drop dramatically. Some games actually do have sound on by default though and are very playable. 
Raiden is a kind of playable example. It had unpleasant flickering effects that may cause epilepsy, so I can't show too much of that. Rayman might as well be considered fully playable, even though the music can get a bit choppy and for some reason the sound effects are completely missing. Tempest 2000, yeah, this is not playable. The graphics are practically missing in most cases. Zool 2 is another example of a largely playable game. This is an actual reason to keep the emulator installed on your Xbox, and that, I think, is really awesome. For this emulator, like with the 3DO, the aspect ratio is stretched, and there doesn't appear to be anything you can do about that. Getting a bit more on the popular side now, here we have Sega Saturn emulation via Yabose CE Public Alpha 2.0. And as can be said for Saturn on most platforms other than PC, it barely functions. And again, the aspect ratio is stretched by force. You'll get single-digit frame rates for just about everything. Got no sound for Daytona USA, but surprisingly it did work for Wipeout. The game was by no means playable, but it was... an experience. I tried Radiant Silver Gun, and this was the best experience with the emulator yet. Even still, it was less than 10 frames per second. The sound played better here than all those other games I tried for it, though, if that means anything for you. It's been said that you can get faster results playing at 480p instead, but those results still aren't going to be able to give you a playable experience. If this emulator ever gets a future revision, it might be worth taking a look into. The best I can hope for, though, is that it would get on the League of the Atari Jaguars emulator, which even in that case only a few games I'd say are playable. Things get really interesting with PlayStation emulation, played on PCSX Reloaded X v0.7. True, I can't put much on here due to the available hard drive space, but this is another emulator that accepts original discs. As such, I was able to test a good few I otherwise couldn't. Still, the emulator notes that playing from a disc will grant slower results than using a ROM. I tested this myself and, yeah, I mean I can tell there's a slight speed up when using ROMs, but honestly it felt pretty similar to me. Maybe my disc drive is in really good condition or something. PCSX Reloaded X v0.7 isn't the only PlayStation emulator. In fact, this one's actually quite a bit newer. Before this one, I tested PCS Xbox V23, and it had some interesting results. I found that certain games, namely Power Slave and Strikers 1945, played better on that earlier emulator. That being said, games like Crash 2 were extremely choppy on that emulator, but were more or less fully playable on PCS X Reloaded X V0.7. Since this emulator is new, I imagine it will eventually dominate over PCS Xbox in every way. For the time being, though, maybe keep both of these installed. Something else I'll have to mention, PCSX Reloaded XV0.7 puts on an anti-aliasing effect by default. I figured some might point that out and suggest it changes performance, but I tested without it and I honestly couldn't notice a difference. There are other settings you can try to mess around with for better speeds, but this caused a lot of graphical issues that are more likely to bother some people. I've read up about how increased RAM to your Xbox can dramatically change how these emulators perform. A lot of modders these days will double the RAM at 128 megabytes, which is said to do wonders for Nintendo 64 emulation. We'll get to that old N64 in a moment, but first... It's fairly interesting how Virtual Boy is handled, with the emulator Virtual Boy XV3 Beta 3. I've never seen the thing emulated this slowly before. This shocked me because of how great the other prior emulators have been on the platform. The Virtual Boy was a decidedly low-spec console for the time. Not much of an improvement over the Super Nintendo, if any. No games for the Virtual Boy appear playable. I mean, I guess that's debatable, but it was all under or around 10 frames per second. Consider me shocked, because I was really expecting better from this. The Nintendo 64 is a very noteworthy platform to be emulated on the Xbox. Accomplished for years and always improving, slowly, this emulator is called Surreal 64 CE B6.0. Before you start downloading some ROMs willy-nilly, consider that an effort has been made to optimize Nintendo 64 games specifically for these Xbox emulators. You can find these ROMs by looking up Earthworm James Xbox N64 Pack. The emulator is suggested to be played in 480p, but the option for 720p is there, so that's what I tried first. Results were half and half. Some had major problems, whether that be slowdown or troubled graphics. Nintendo presents. Others played really well. I wouldn't say anything was perfect, but totally playable in many cases. Super Mario 64 was fine, Mario Kart 64 was fine, and Star Fox 64 was usually fine, with some stuttering here and there. No! Turok 2 was actually playing alright. Some stuttering, but would you actually believe this ran better than Smash Brothers? Hydro Thunder didn't have any sound for some reason, but played at a full 60 frames. Damn. Need some bad examples though? Super Smash Brothers stuttered constantly. Fox tried to persuade me into loot axe, but I wasn't okay with that, so I pistol zapped his ass back to Corneria. Wipeout 64 was... Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! Well, it played too fast. In each ROM settings, you'll find them attributed to a specific core. It seems the selection has been handpicked for each game. Though most games seem to launch under the 1964 core. You can swap the cores if you really want to, though I imagine the default sets are going to get you the best results. I actually did try swapping cores for Smash Brothers, and it just crashed the Xbox, so yeah. Of course, I had to try this emulator in 480p mode, so I did, and, you know, wasn't much of a difference. 
I think Smash Brothers in particular played exactly the same, if not worse actually. No clue. So those are the home consoles, now let's take a look at arcade emulation. Typically I wouldn't jump from home consoles to arcade, but for the Xbox I'm making an exception. The four controller ports specifically make the Xbox a great multiplayer platform. Since arcade games are known to focus on this element of gaming, it's fitting for arcade emulation to have a solid focus in the Xbox emulation scene. Ironically, however, we're starting with one that kinda stumped me. You see, it's preferred to be playing Neo Geo games via Final Burn emulators. However, each instance of Final Burn I tried had some type of error loading the games. This is generally due to missing parent files required for those arcade games to run. I've always had a lot of trouble with this. You have to kinda know what files you need prior, despite there isn't much of a way to know other than researching each individual game. This would be to the inconvenience of most. Unfortunately, I suppose, there is an alternative, and that's what I've chosen for the video. That would be Coax v0.11. By the way, both emulators in question should be able to, additionally, run Capcom Play System games. Oh, and to those saying the Neo Geo AES isn't an arcade system but a home console, I know this. But at the same time, I've always felt that the library insinuates it is an arcade system, just built for the comfort of your home. So, why did I first mention Final Burn over Kawax? Well, Kawax is stuck in 480p, so naturally the games aren't going to look nearly as crisp. In comparison, Final Burn looked far better. Alas, finding the right ROM files is a pain and a half. So this had to do, for it was able to load tons of ROMs, whereas Final Burn refused without me having to dig across the net for obscure files. Kawax is a very well-designed emulator, and it makes sense that it's restricted to 480p. Why? Well, it's old. For Neo Geo games, I do recommend Final Burn over Kawax, but if you just can't be bothered trying to find all those associated files, Kawax will do a good job with a reduced score for presentation. To my embarrassment, the following emulator I also can't give a proper demonstration for. This time at least it isn't really my fault. The Laserdisc platform is known for full video classics like Dragon's Lair and Space Ace. Alas, the format was known to have very large file sizes associated with the games, at least for its time. Even still, I don't have enough space on my Xbox for even one of these games. So this menu is really all I've got to work with today. From what I've seen, the emulation is superb for this emulator, so if you have the space for it, Daphne XV 0.96 is the way to go. CD-based platforms aren't all doomed to massive file sizes, even though that generally would be the case. For the Neo Geo CD, a good few games aren't too huge, which allowed me to demonstrate X Neo Rain 1.2.11. This is another emulator that, mind you, can launch original games from the CDs if you have them. The readme for this emulator states it was built off the best existing Neo Geo CD emulator out there, and that comes as no surprise to me. All the games I tried played perfectly. The only flaw is the forced, stretched aspect ratio. By the look of things, there's no way to change it to match the original. So long as that doesn't bug you, this emulator does the job and does it well. The last two emulators for the arcade would be Final Burn Legends v1.26 and Mamo Extras v2.1. Ah, the battle for the best dedicated arcade emulator. Well, I can already say that hands down, Final Burn Legends v1.26 takes the lead. It offers crispy 720p, whereas Mamo Extras v2.1, despite not being that old of an update, supports 480p at its highest. Weird. As you might expect by now from arcade emulation, each build has different compatibility. You might find having both installed is a good idea. Final Burn Legends is probably the way to go. I say probably because the library of compatible arcade games is way too massive. Everything will vary. What works versus what doesn't is gonna have to be determined by your own hands. If there's one thing that needs to be said, everything played at perfect speeds on both emulators. With the exception of Go Go Mile Smile. That one always seemed to struggle a bit, not sure why. Played a damn fine game of Turtles in Time just after though. Can't complain. Just as a side note, before I moved out I had a big yard sale, where me and my friends played through a whole bunch of classic side-scrolling arcade beat-em-ups in the garage as people were showing up. Once you got everything up and running as you like, a one-time process as long as you don't delete anything, the Xbox is a perfect choice for multiplayer gaming. The arcade emulation really sells it alone. Alright, so those were the arcade systems. Now on to those handhelds. Starting with the Game Boy and Game Boy Color models using X-Boy Advance X25. A multi-purpose emulator will take a look at again for the emulation of Game Boy Advance. In terms of Game Boy, I tried a bunch of games, mostly fine, some mild stuttering on Bonk's Adventure, but by all means playable. Didn't have any issues with the Game Boy Color games I tried, even hacks played fine. Yet again though, with Game Boy Color emulation, I ran into a struggle with Shantae. This did not play well at all. Flickering graphics, terrible slowdown, the menu's usually missing. Unless you go to the top of the map where it removes the first layer of sprites and speeds up? Very strange indeed. Now, I have tried multiple Game Boy emulators on the Xbox, and this is indeed both the latest and greatest. It's great for what you want to do, probably, unless what you want to do is play Shantae. One last time, we'll take a look at Mecha XV2 for its emulation of Sega's Game Gear. 
Honestly, if I had anything new to say, I'd say it, but no. Mecha XV2 is very good at emulating the Game Gear. No complaints. It's Atari's one portable, the Lynx, emulated by Mednafen X Lynx 7. The emulation for this handheld is usually a tad wishy-washy. First impressions were good, until I played the Raiden port. Graphics would frequently corrupt in this game. One time, it even crashed. I tried Road Blasters, a notorious game when it comes to Atari Lynx emulation. Usually the bottom HUD flickers, and yep, still doing that here. Thankfully, most Lynx games played fine for me, even those that didn't were still playable. Here's a platform I've only heard of before, the Watara Supervision, emulated by Supervision XV4. So, granted, I'm unfamiliar with the system, but the emulation here seems... okay. On rare occasion, I would come across garbled graphics, and for a good amount of the games I played, there was no sound. However, each game still remains playable by the look of things. Neo Geo's pocket and colored models will be covered by Neopop XV6. Another instance where I have nothing of value to add here, because the emulation was flawless. None of the games I played had any noticeable issues. I'm about to head over to Pink Gorilla to get us some Bondi Wonderswans, emulated with Wonderswan XV5. Yeah, I'm really gonna want to go pick up that genuine Wonderswan after toying with this emulator. Truth be told, some games appear to play fine, others run slow or the sound is all kinds of messed up. Other than for a few choice games like Mr. Driller, I'd recommend emulating Wonderswan elsewhere. Back to X-Boy Advance V25 for emulating Game Boy Advance games. I'm aware of some system-intensive Game Boy Advance games, so I tried all of those. No issues with the first-person shooters. Speed-based games like Sonic Advance 2 worked great. I tried Smashing Drive, one of those advanced 3D games. And I'm pretty sure this was playing slower than hardware, but not significantly. I had the same kind of problem with Rayman Hoodlum's Revenge. I'm not sure if it was the frame rate, more so it had some stuttering problems. It's playable, but it's just not entirely smooth. Seems as if every game will play, though, and I'm sure the vast majority are playing at full speeds. Usually these older consoles have trouble running Nintendo DS emulation, and the Xbox, while promising, and perhaps better than some of the competition, still struggles with Desmume XV 0.87. Games play between half to 75% of the intended speed for the most part, which I suppose makes some of these playable. Sound is enabled for all of them, and that's about as you'd expect. Games like Kirby Squeak Squad might be enjoyable to play at this speed. I guess the point is it's doable. Stuck on a suck V2. Might be wondering how I accomplished this. Not the suck, the uh, bringing the bubble into Kirby's mouth. Well, you can actually swap screens on the fly with the press of a button. The cursor here can then be moved around, clicked and dragged. Minigame types definitely don't call for this kind of thing, but for a game like Kirby, it works. As a whole though, 3D games are a no-go. Mario Kart DS? No thanks. Could you believe New Super Mario Bros. is still playing like three times better than the speed of my netbook that I played it on back in like 2009? With that said, I'm sure many people would consider this playable. I mean, it very much is, it's just not preferable these days. Someone put that poor rabbit out of its misery. Touch the dead is real slow, but that's probably a better idea when touching the dead. And yeah, there's Nintendo DS emulation on Xbox. Again, like the Jaguar, some games might be loosely playable, but most of it won't be. And now for the part I usually hate, computer emulation. Typically plagued by nondescript keyboard controls and wacky disk swaps. It takes a lot of mental work to figure out if you're going in blind. Some of them are still fairly easy to deal with, but the first one isn't. Thankfully in this case I was able to figure out how to work with it and I'll explain that to you. This emulator is Kegs XV5 for Apple II emulation. So when you first select a game what you're going to want to do is use the arrow keys to navigate to control panel, slots, highlight startup, and press left or right until it shows slot 6. Press return or enter to save, quit, and now when you boot up another game, it should boot as normal. Well, as normal as the emulator allows for, or my brain anyhow. Honestly, I never know with these computer games. A few of these games I tried worked fine without a hassle. Others either wanted something extra from me, like Boulder Dash, or they were just looping. In terms of speed, they seem to work just fine, so if you're patient enough or know what you're doing, this might be a great emulator for you. Returning to the similarly built 5200, we have the Atari 800, emulated again with Atari XL Box V8.05B. I don't expect this to be much trouble, the Atari 800 usually isn't, and it wasn't. Every game booted and played normally. I can only wish all the computer systems were like this for loading ROMs. DOS can be an issue to emulate on consoles due to the need of mounting games properly. Thankfully, DOSBox V13 for Xbox doesn't require that. It has its own navigator for easily selecting and loading games. 
It's not perfect though, and my reason to say that mostly resides in the way it controls. It seems as if there's no way to set keyboard-specific controls, instead relying solely on joypad compatibility. Some games I tried don't even have joypad support, so they appear to be unplayable. In some cases, I'd have to use the game's own options using the virtual keyboard to select joypad. Something that always perplexes me with these computer emulators is, why can't they have some type of easy control swap feature built in? To swap between keyboard and joypad? Of course, it would only apply a few keys, but at least give you the most common of layouts. Arrow keys, control, spacebar, enter, you know, the basics. I have no idea what was even happening here in 4x4 off-road racing. Wolfenstein 3D behaved strangely as well. I'm not sure how to explain it, but essentially I would walk extremely slowly until I would open a door and suddenly I'm Usain Bolt. Only for a handful of seconds, then I'd go back to a snail's pace. On the positive side, I love the navigation in this emulator. This is the kind of ease I want to see in DOS emulation. Thankfully, in recent years, this is becoming more the norm. In addition, the games themselves performed very well, and when I could control them properly, they were fully playable and enjoyable. Full speeds all around. The unfortunate oversights and issues this emulator has with controls, though, sells it a little short. With some work, this could be outstanding. As is, well, it's alright, I guess. Sinclair's ZX Spectrum is next with Didn't X Spectrum V5. You... you didn't what? Some games booted instantly, others took a really long time. I can only assume that's normal. Some games played great, others had errors like the missing music in Bosconian 87. Then there was the occasional one that wouldn't respond past the title screen. A lot of them, however, I just couldn't control. Or maybe just one of the buttons would work. Even using a keyboard in some cases didn't seem to do anything. At least the game seemed to be playing at full speeds. Yet again, I must say it could be my inexperience with the system causing this, but at least for those interested in trying out some of the games, this might not be your preferred platform of choice for the ZX Spectrum. Are you on the Spectrum? I'm sorry. Now for the Commodore 64 using Vice 64 XV11. This emulator takes forever to transfer over due to there being nearly 6,000 files contained in the folder. And to be honest, I think a lot of those aren't even necessary, but don't quote me on it. Once you got it on your Xbox though, expect to have a near flawless C64 experience, minus the intro screens that... Maybe this is a controversial opinion, but I really feel like ROMs with intros should either be removed before uploading or not even uploaded at all. At least with a warning or disclaimer, but yeah, solid emulator. For the MSX, we'll be using Blue MS Xbox V8. Oh, what the hell was that crap? This is a very solid emulator, safe for one thing. I know it's an intensive game, but you gotta have a working Metal Gear. Yeah, no matter what I tried, couldn't get that game to work. Everything else I threw it at work perfectly though, even Superboy, but I fear using Superboy and Perfect in the same sentence. For emulation of the Amstrad CPC, we'll use Arnold XV5. Yeah, this was basically flawless, unless you're coming across a game with DRM passwords. No Titus the Fox for me. Everything else worked like a charm. Another solid emulator. The Commodore Amiga uses the Win UAEX Lite V19 emulator. Like many before it, the Amiga may have random shenanigans you'll need to deal with before a game starts. In Amiga's case, you may even have to insert a second disc, and I have no idea how to do that. Even when I booted games with a second disc inserted, it often told me to put in that second disc, despite in theory it was already there. Well, the games that didn't require additional discs work great for me, so yeah, it is a solid emulator. I'm probably just missing something. Lastly, the Sharp X68000 will be emulated using X68000X V6. I tried Arkanoid 2 Revenge of Doe, and by the end of it, I was the one saying no! Controller and keypad didn't seem to react to the game past the control screen, so I guess that's unplayable. Some choice games of mine, though, played flawlessly. Bosconian? Perfect. Bubble Bobble? Perfect. Lots of other games, no flaws to report. I deliberately tried a system-intensive game, F-15 Eagle Strike 2. Yep, now that's what I call slow. So as long as you're keeping to the 2D games, to my knowledge being majority of the Sharp X68000 library, you should be good to play your favorite titles on this emulator. Alright, so those were the emulators I tried for the Xbox. Keep in mind I did try multiple of each console and have reported the ones that perform best in this video, making sure I was using the latest versions in each case. There are a few more emulators I skipped talking about, mostly for reasons like with the Atari ST emulator where I couldn't even boot a game, I had no idea what was going on. I thought it was really interesting to discover that an emulator for plug-and-play consoles exists, specifically those that ran on the SPG2XX chip, but unfortunately I couldn't find a site that offered the ROMs. The Xbox is an emulation machine, no doubt, but it isn't perfect. Several platforms that are totally capable of being emulated on the system still don't run well, like the Wonder Swan and Virtual Boy. Not much to complain about, I doubt many will really care, but it seems still a little bizarre to me. In some ways, to me, the PSP's emulation scene feels a bit more developed. 
I'm just saying that in comparison, I feel like the PSP had more of a focus in the areas where it mattered most. After all, the PSP is far less powerful than the original Xbox, yet the speed and platforms it is capable of running are not too dissimilar. You would expect for the Xbox it would be leagues above, when in reality that's only somewhat true. Granted, the PSP is still actively being worked on for emulation, not as much as before but still to a degree. It is a great portable solution for emulation. These days, a lot of efforts to bring more platforms or speed to certain platforms is more pointless on the Xbox than ever, since so many more home emulation stations have come to light in recent years, especially like with the Wii and the Wii U, which require far less effort to be modded. People have moved on from the Xbox, and in many ways it does make sense. What the Xbox needed the most has already been achieved, and that is solid arcade emulation. The Xbox is a multiplayer monster. It's no wonder that many Xboxes even today are the brains behind MAME arcade cabinets. The controller ports and emulation support makes it a fantastic choice for gaming get-togethers. The Wii shares its number of controller slots with the Xbox via GameCube controllers, though since the Wii's emulation scene does not surpass the Xbox, Xbox has the high ground in that situation. But not only that, the GameCube controllers aren't everyone's favorite. When you want to sit down and play with a bunch of your friends, generally you'll want something that people find universally comfortable. Let's just forget about the Duke controller for a second. I know that when it comes to playing multiplayer arcade games at home, there's no question about what platform I'll use. Ultimately, I turn to my Xbox. And with the countless other emulators that work great if not perfectly, the Xbox is still a beast of an emulation station. 